You're listening to The Crunch with Cam Slater. Right here on RCR. Reality Check Radio. Olivia's view on The Crunch today will encompass thoughts and insights from the French romantic novelist Victor Hugo to the horrors of the 20th century and now rampant Holocaust denial. The beginning of Victor Hugo's romantic novel Les Miserables is devoted to the extraordinary character of Monseigneur Bienvenu Mehiel, the Bishop of Diagne, who is responsible for the main character, Jean Valjean's conversion from darkness to light. When the bishop offers Jean Valjean food, comfort and lodging out of pure benevolence, knowing that he was at that time a fiend, he treats the ex-convict as an honoured guest, serving him food on silver plates with silver candlesticks to light their table. One feels that a worm is in the presence of one of the most rarefied souls ever to grace God's earth. Later that night, in the grip of fossilized hate and bitterness, Valjean steals the silver plate and disappears into the night, only to be swiftly apprehended by the local gendarmes and brought back to the bishop's residence. Knowing this event will have Valjean sent back to the torturous galleys of cruel imprisonment, the bishop puts on an act in front of the gendarmes for Valjean's sake alone. Quote, Ah, there you are. I'm glad to see you. Why, I gave you the candlesticks too, which are also silver and will fetch you 200 francs. Why did you not take them away with the rest of the plate? End quote. The gendarmes leave and Bishop Mahiel quietly speaks to Valjean's damaged spirit. Quote, forget not, never forget that you have promised me to use the silver to become an honest man. Jean Valjean, my brother, you belong no longer to evil but to good. It is your soul that I am buying for you. I withdraw it from dark thoughts and from the spirit of perdition and I give it to God. End quote. The bishop's redemptive love and courage forever light the mind of Jean Valjean, but we never again meet him in the pages of the book. The development of the human soul and the deeply personal responsibility for the integrity of one's conscience that accompanies that development is an obsession with Hugo. His created heroes like Jean Valjean, who willingly take on the responsibility of self and others, but above all, are commanded to rise. Gavroche, the ill-fated young street urchin who acts like a mother to all the little lost orphans of the Parisian streets by taking it upon himself that they're fed, sheltered, and comforted. Then there's the magnificently fierce insurrectionist, Enjolras, who leads his brothers in arms with an almost imperial dignity to fight for the dawn of new world democracy. Quote, The menacing majesty of Enjolras, disarmed and motionless, appeared to oppress this tumult, and this young man, haughty, bloody, and charming, who alone had not a wound, who was as indifferent as an invulnerable being, seemed, by the authority of his tranquil glance, to constrain the sinister rebel to kill him respectfully. End quote. Hugo's noble vision of man, before any kind of socialism was to be implemented anywhere in the world, was heavily influenced by the Enlightenment philosophers, of course, and their dedication to republicanism. In 1878, Hugo made a speech at the 100-year anniversary of the death of Voltaire, where he proclaimed the essence of republican virtue. Quote, Let the 18th century come to the help of the 19th. The philosophers, our predecessors, are the apostles of the true. Let us invoke those illustrious shades. Let them, before monarchies, meditate wars, proclaim the right of man to life, the right of conscience to liberty, the sovereignty of reason, the holiness of labor, and the beneficence of peace. And since night issues from the thrones, 
let the light come from the tombs. End quote. Hugo's vision of impending human progress was indeed so remarkably hopeful that only one year later he made a final public speech in 1879 where he painted this utopian picture of the coming century, the 20th, that we now know in hindsight happened to be the bloodiest century in the entire history of man's existence. Quote, In the 20th century, war will be dead. The scaffold will be dead. Hatred will be dead. Frontier boundaries will be dead. Dogmas will be dead. Man will live. End quote. Tragically, how wrong he was. Perhaps Hugo's over-optimism was only off by a hundred years. Maybe the 21st century can become a time for peace among nations. Though, somehow, I doubt that at this particular point in time. I don't think even the supremely perceptive Victor Hugo, who, though a Catholic, had a particular interest in Judaic culture and tradition, his elder brother was named Abel, a decidedly Hebrew name, I don't think he could have ever imagined what the Jews were to be subjected to during the Nazi occupation of Europe, only 54 years after Hugo's death. Anti-Semitism, as Douglas Murray often points out, is a shape-shifting virus, and one that has made a swift comeback in our own time only 80 years after the Jewish Holocaust of World War II. I have, a few days ago, written an essay titled Holocaust Denial, A Cultural Marxist Infection, published on my blog, oliviapearson.org where I claim that today's anti-Semitism is a result of historical revisionism, which has always been an indispensable tool of the cultural Marxists in order to smash any certainty about our history, our value judgments, and therefore our moral thinking. Academia deployed revisionism and critical theory so successfully in our postmodern era that now overt anti-Semitism has exploded again in our faces, and Holocaust deniers are having an absolute field day all over social media and media. To comment that this is a a disturbing phenomenon would be a gross understatement, for it happens to be downright blood-chilling. Holocaust denial is not just merely historical revisionism. It is what is properly understood as historical negationism a pure denial or negating of the historical record, known facts, and collective memories from experience. To deny the Holocaust today is a fool's errand that amounts to a complete blanking out of the enormous amount of evidence available over the last 80 years. The crimes themselves only happened because the average German civilian, in real time during those dark years, did the very same blank out, allowing it all to come to pass. They bought the delusions, along with all the horrors encased within the evil euphemisms, as to Holocaust deniers today, fueled by the historical negationists who create such deniers. I'm not entirely sure what motivates the Holocaust deniers to keep doubling down on militantly ignorant denialism of this kind, but my suspicion would be something in the vicinity of the need to negate Jewish exceptionalism throughout the ages of history, including our own age. Adolf Eichmann offers a clue to this when interviewed in 1957 by Willem Sassen, a Dutch-German Nazi living in Argentina, along with Eichmann, before Eichmann was kidnapped by Mossad to stand trial and be executed in Israel for war crimes. According to the Sassen papers, Eichmann said, quote, I will not humble myself or repent in any way. I could do it too cheaply in today's climate of opinion. It would be too easy to pretend that I had turned suddenly from a Saul to a Paul. No, I must say truthfully that if we had killed all the 10 million Jews that Himmler's statisticians originally listed in 1933, 
I would say, good, we have destroyed an enemy. But here I do not mean wiping them out entirely. That would not be proper. And we carried on a proper war. Continuing with Eichmann. Now, however, when through the malice of fate, a large part of these Jews, whom we fought against, are alive, I must concede that fate must have wanted it so. I always claimed that we were fighting against a foe who, through thousands of years of learning and development, had become superior to us. Still with Eichmann. I no longer remember exactly when, but it was even before Rome itself had been founded that the Jews could already write. It is very depressing for me to think of that people writing laws over 6,000 years of written history, but it tells me that they must be a people of the first magnitude, for lawgivers have always been great. End quote. Now that admission from a true blue fascist who could clearly observe Jewish exceptionalism despite being one of the worst anti-Semites who ever lived, tells a tale on today's Holocaust deniers, armed with their historical negationists, infected by critical theory in a postmodern culture. The existence of the Israeli state today is the penultimate example of Jewish exceptionalism, and look how viciously the world condemns them for defending their own state. On October 7th, an actual real-life pogrom happened, another genocide of Jews, killed, tortured, raped, and taken hostage, for nothing more than the fact that they were Jews. Yet they have been condemned by so many for defending themselves with a war against the people who perpetuated this evil upon them. This is the same equivalent of Holocaust denial, people blanking out the actual atrocities which occurred. They ignored that Israel was the victim here and call them Nazis. This is peak woke, disgusting cultural Marxism, where everything is turned on its head, where black is white, wrong is right, and evil is good. And today's university educated zombies buy it, hook, line, and sinker, because they lack the ability to ethically think about any issue with moral clarity. Facts to these people do not matter a damn. They grab hold of any issue and only inflate the emotional aspects of it, inflamed by media spin, and abandon all reason and logic to promulgate the worst falsities, such as Israel is an apartheid state which is now committing genocide against Palestinians. What hogwash from moral runts. A genocide was committed against Israelis. The Nazis in this equation are the Islamists, which seek to wipe Jews off the map again. Never again has become Jews deserve it again. And the same people who denied the World War II Holocaust are now denying the obvious, the Islamic intent for another one. Again, as Douglas Murray said, Anti-Semitism is a shape-shifting virus, virus being the operative word here. And that is Olivia's view for The Crunch this week. Thank you for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to, either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057, that's 2057, or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you, so connect with us today.